think the batters are on. It's all the hookups are on. Testing, can you hear me? Okay, I'm on. I'm on a little bit. Oh, any rate, I hate these things. They just feel like a rock star sitting there. Trying to get this thing out of. Trying to get this thing out where I can't see it. Doesn't distract me, you know, kind of thing. We're gonna go see. Um, Casting Crown, so on April 26th, up in New York, I'm just excited to go see, but I mean, you see all those guys wearing their hits, desks, and their pieces and everything, you know, I'm thinking, that's not me, you know, but at any rate, uh, I used to like the little Pell mics, you know, but uh, anyway, they say this does a better job, so. Uh, none of you can see this, right? It's the same color as my skin, so it doesn't even show up to you guys, right? <laughs> We're going to continue with the book of Mark, oh, excuse me, with the, with the character of Peter in these things. We're going to be out of the Gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, and John, and so forth, after the day, because we're going to go post-Pentecost, we're going to go into the book of Acts and follow Peter a little bit. But today we're still in one of the Gospels, because there's one more thing we need to get right with the Apostle Peter. We've been watching him go through all these different exercises and going through the books. And so we want to take a look at him today. Um, the section we're looking at, if you want to pull it up, is going to be in John. And this is unusual that we, because we haven't been in John most of the time, but we're going to book, be in the book of John, uh, chapter 21 today. So if you want to take a look there, and one of the best verses, or I don't say best verses, one of the key verses that is in the book of John is in chapter 20, verse 31, because it gives the purpose of the book of John. And it says, These things I have written, if you're following with, with, with me, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that hearing you might have life in his name. So the book of John has been written, I mean, it's, it's a little different than everything else because of that reason. John is trying to give a treatise and events that will prove that Jesus Christ is God. And he even starts his, and I, I, again, who am I to do this, but if I were reordering the New Testament, I would put John first in the New Testament. Then I'd go to Matthew, Mark, uh, maybe swap those out, and I'd finish up with Luke. Why? Because Luke would then be next to Acts, and Luke and Acts are a two-volume set of the book that Luke wrote, and John would be the beginning, which kind of matches the first part of the Bible, because John starts out, what? In the, was the Word. And how does the Genesis 1-1 start out? God. So John is, I think, very definitely trying to make a parallel between his gospel and how the Old Testament starts, and his purpose is to show that Jesus Christ is God. I was talking to a, um, a Jewish friend this last week, in fact, and um, a person was uh, very, uh, you know, I, I almost thought they were a Christian. They believe in Jesus Christ. They've come that far now and so forth, but the person said, I just can't believe that Jesus is God. Um, the person's Jewish, you know. That is the biggest stumbling block for them. Uh, I was at a, um, I was at a, um, uh, military dinner last night, and uh, the the man who invited me to, to uh, pray was Jewish, and um, he, he's a very good friend of mine. Uh, we've we've got very close together over the years because as a chaplain, I was to, I am to support all faiths. I don't perform all faiths. I support those that are uh, you know Protestant or, or my faith, but I provide for all the faiths. So if they're Jehovah, if, if, well, there's no Jehovah's Witnesses in the military, but if there's a, if there's a Mormon, oh, there's a picture. Here we are at the dinner last night. Got a picture at the Union League in front of uh, Benjamin, uh, in front of uh, Abraham Lincoln, because that's uh, what the Union League was designed for. But at any rate, um, this this um, he's a command sergeant major now. He asked me to pray, but we he, we developed a relationship because when we were on different exercises together, I always tried to make sure that he got to the synagogue, and I would go with him. I wear my yarmulke and I pull out the you know their Hebrew scriptures that they were using. I try to read backwards like the Hebrews read and try to see if I could keep up to with them when they're and they're Hebrew and I you know if I could end the same place I thought well at least I got a couple of words to be able to follow for my Hebrew from a seminary. But at any rate, I'm all of that to say that um, it's very important for the for John to be able to introduce who Jesus Christ is. And so 2031 kind of says this is the summary. So some people think well 21 is kind of a tack on and they're not sure if maybe John wrote this as a later point and he kind of finished his gospel chapter 20 verse 31 and then added this later on in life um, as he was as time was going on or what but this particular episode I call by the lakeside or back beside the lakeside and uh, in this section he tries to correct a rumor that had gotten started because of something that happened at the lakeside and so we think maybe put this on afterwards but we're going to look at that because it involves Peter and Peter is very important to this particular section as we look at this today. 
And why would they be in Galilee seeing Jesus? Well, if you look back to what the ladies were told by the angels, and Jesus Christ himself said, he said this, Matthew 28, verses 7 through 10, it said twice, Take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, there they shall see me. So the disciples know they're headed back for Galilee. When they get there, here's Jesus showing up in Galilee with them. So we're going to take a look at this. I don't know if you heard the story ever of the uh, fisherman. I'm not a good fisherman. Anybody have fishermen in here? Anybody do well fishing? Okay. I'm a lousy fisherman. My dad didn't have the patience for me. never taught me. I mean, my biggest claim to when I was age 30 was the nine-inch pike I caught in our uh, Audubon Lake one year. I just, I, I, that's just not my thing kind of thing. Uh, we did go out, and I got, did get a sturgeon uh, out in the uh, Pacific Ocean one time, but not a fisherman. This one fisherman, he'd go out, and he always caught his limit every single time he went out. So the, the uh, fishing uh, warden, the game commission, where we are, said, hey, George, uh, can I go out? I'm sorry, George. I know you're a fisherman. I wouldn't intend that. Uh, so, can I go out with some time? He says, you're doing such a great job. I'd like to learn how you fish, man. You just, I mean, you just got it on. And so I said, sure, come on out next week, George. So George went out with them, the, the game warden, and uh, they went out the middle of the lake, and uh, they uh, opened up his box, his tackle box, pulled out a stick of dynamite, lit it, and threw it overboard. Boom! And all the fish started coming to the surface. <laughs> and and uh, he said, and the game warden started giving him a lecture. You, you can't do that. That's not the way you fish. You're, you're not allowed. That's, that's illegal. And they scooped up the fish, and the guy didn't pay any attention to the game warden. He just reached down in his box, pulled another stick of dynamite, lit it, gave it to the game warden, and said, are you here to fish or talk? <laughs> that's not the way uh, Peter was fishing back in those days, but they find themselves on the lake. So let's take a look at that, if you will, with me. Let's turn to John chapter 21 and follow them through this particular exercise today. The first thing we find is, and I call failure at the old trade. Failure at the old trade. Um, when things get rough, sometimes we revert back to what's familiar, right? If things aren't going right, we go back and let's do what we were used to doing. Let's, let's, let's do something we're good at. And that's what I'm the Peter, you know? He had just, he had just denied Jesus Christ Jesus Christ had died on the cross. Now, he had seen Jesus. He had had a private encounter with him at one time. So he knew he was raised. But, I mean, what are they going to do? Jesus is not there physically anymore. He's used to following him around, and Jesus is telling him what to do. And so he's just kind of saying, you know, what am I going to do? So he, we find him here with the disciples. He's with seven of them, actually, him, seven of them included. So as you look at it, it says, uh, there were, these were the seven, verse 2. It says, first of all was, um, of course, I'm Peter. Then Thomas. How do we know Thomas. Doubting Thomas, right, put your hands and fingers. Thomas also was the one that said, you know, when Jesus was going to Bethany, let's go to Bethany so we can die with him. I mean, he was ready to die. I mean, he thought this is the end when we go to Bethany. Um, he was also the one that uh, we all know this verse and love this verse, John 14, 6. What is it? I am the way, I am the truth, the life comes to the Father except by me. Do you know why Jesus said that? Because Thomas asked the question, where are you going? And how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I'm the way. So that whole verse was a reaction to what Thomas said. So Thomas is there at this particular occasion. We find Nathaniel's there from Cana in Galilee. What do we know about Cana? Anybody know? Huh? Right, wedding feast. First miracle happened in Nathaniel's town. So Nathaniel's there. And then it says we also have uh, James and John. Who were they called? They were called the Sons of Thunder sometimes, okay? Uh, John is the one that wrote this book, but John was well known. Um, for a number of things. He was called the what? What kind of disciple? The beloved disciple. We have James. What was James' claim to fame? Huh? Oh, he was John. He was, well, he was a cousin, but it was John's, it was Peter, it was James and John were brothers, but he was the first martyr. He was the first one they killed. In fact, when later on we'll find they put Peter in prison because they, it pleased the Jews so much that he'd killed James. So James, this one that was part of the three, got killed early on in the book of Acts. So he's one of those. So he's there, James and John. And then it says two others were also there. And we don't know who those were. Uh, they surmised maybe it was, uh, one of them was Andrew since he was a brother of Peter. Um, they just don't know who the other two, but two other disciples were there. So these seven are up there in uh, Galilee waiting for Jesus. And in verse 3 it says, And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. I don't know what the attitude was, what the problem was, but he just, he's there waiting for, I mean, we're waiting for Jesus. He hasn't shown up yet. I'm just going to go fishing. 
That's what he was used to. In fact, they had fished the Sea of Galilee. In fact, if you remember back, what was the first time we saw Peter and, and Jesus together? On the Sea of Galilee. He, called, he saw them and said, go put your boat. He said, you're full. Uh, you know, you didn't catch all, fish all night. Go on out. And they said, Peter says, well, you know what? We fished all night, didn't catch any, but if you say it, we'll go out and do it. And so they go out on the lake. Here it is, almost deja vu, coming back again. Here they are at the lake again. Peter says, I'm going fishing. In verse 3, it says, Then they said to him, We'll come with you too. And they all went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Again, caught nothing. And so Jesus shows up on the seashore, and we're still talking about this failure of the old trade. He shows up on the it was seashore in verse 4, and he says, But when the day was now breaking, so it was getting close, close to dawn, probably couldn't see very well. They were about 100 yards out into the, into the lake. So they're about a football field out into the lake. Um, and Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Now, we don't know why they didn't know it was Jesus. Was it because it was still a little bit dark and they couldn't quite see him? Was it because uh, he was... He hid his identity to them for some reason because he did that. Remember the road to Emmaus? They were walking and they, and they didn't recognize him. Um, maybe maybe his, his spiritual form a little bit different than his physical form was so that they didn't know his body and didn't recognize him. We don't know why. Maybe he intended that they not know who he was. But here he is on the seashore and they don't know who he is. Jesus therefore said to them, children. So he uses this little different word. He says, children or lads. It's not like, you know, disciples. He didn't use a familiar word, but it's like, you know, you're my children. You know, lads, have you caught anything? And he actually phrases it in such a way that the answer should be no. Children, you do not have any fish, do you? It's not, did you catch anything? You don't have any fish, right? He's expecting them to say, and it says in verse 5, they answer no. One of the books I really enjoyed reading the leadership a while back was called um, Good to Great by Jim Collins. If you haven't read it, I mean, just if you're into leadership, it was like one of the key books, and I just really loved that book. But he had about six principles in it. But one of the principles was, as a good leader, is to face the brutal facts. So many times we ignore facts, you know. I mean, uh, in the military, <laughs> you know, you don't want to tell the commander the bad news. In, in business, you don't want to tell your boss, sales are down, <laughs> we're not doing very good, especially if you're the sales manager, right? Uh, you don't, nobody likes bad news. But what's worse than bad news? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> lying or not giving them the bad news so that it gets worse and worse and worse. I was going to say, like, uh, it's unlike fine wine. It does not get better with age. Bad news, get it over with. You need to face the facts. And that's what, that's what uh, Jim Collins said in his book was one of the principles. Face the brutal facts. Know what you're looking at because otherwise you'll never get the right diagnosis or know where to go. And so they faced the brutal facts was, do you have any fish? And the answer was, no, no, no fish. I've got a principle, and I'll try to do this as we go through. We have uh, four, four sections here this morning, and each one I'll have a principle with. And I, this is my principle for this one, and if the final theme doesn't hit you, maybe one of these principles will as we go along. And my principle is this. Things fail when we don't allow the old ways to pass. Things fail when we don't allow the old things to pass. Sometimes we just go back to what's familiar. We, we don't, we, instead of looking ahead, we look back in the back, and I don't know if Peter's looking at his denial. I don't know if he's looking at his, his fishing and saying, well, at least I can do that. And he gets out and finds out what? <laughs> he really can't do that anymore, you know? Um, there's a couple of verses that I want to throw out here to you to, to kind of, if you want to write the verses. In fact, I think the references are in your, book, your uh, notes there. Luke 9, 62, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. He says, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Whereas once you start working for God, once you put him in your life, if you start looking back, you're not fit to keep going. We need to keep looking forward. And then in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We can't always look back. We can't always go back. And so this principle says we, we fail when we, st when we start looking backwards and don't allow those things to pass. Keep looking forward. The second section I have here is verses 6 through 14, and I call this successful with Jesus. Successful with Jesus. 
The picture here is Jesus sitting with the guys on the seashore beside this uh, fire that he has as they look in. So let's just follow this through a little bit for, for further, and starting at verse uh, 6. It says, For he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find a catch. They cast, therefore, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. I call this, in verse 6, the great catch. Um, <laughs> I'm surprised they did this a little bit. Who did they know was on the seashore? They didn't. No, they didn't. Now, if you're this great fisherman, you've been fishing for all of your life, maybe 20, 25, 30 years. You grew up with your fa father teaching you how to fish. And some stranger on the seashore says, you know, you've been fishing all night. You don't got any fish. Cast the net on the other side of the fish. Would you do it? You say, I can do it myself. You don't know anything about fishing. We've been out here all night. If there were fish here, we would have caught them. You say, well, sometimes, sometimes our phrase might be, right, uh, don't tell me what to do. Anybody ever said that? Don't tell me what to do. We want to do it ourselves, you know. We don't, and, and I can just see Peter. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised these guys did. I can just say, you don't know anything. Don't tell me what to do. And when we do that, what happens? Sometimes we miss things that we shouldn't miss. He said, throw it on the other side. And I don't know what compelled them. I don't know what compelled them to do it. Um, Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before a fall or before destruction, and a haughty spirit before stumbling. So we need to keep that humble spirit to, you know, maybe take outside input. Maybe that person, that stranger, knows more than you do. Even though you don't know that or you don't think that, there might be good advice there listen. So the application is sometimes we don't act on God's will because we're too comfortable with what we're presently doing. Peter could have said, I'm too comfortable fishing and I'm, I'm just going to keep on doing it. And he doesn't act on what the stranger said. And sometimes we get that way also, right? We get in a rut. Anybody ever get in a rut? You know? You, just, you don't want to change. You don't want to do something different. You want to just keep the status quo. And by doing that sometimes, we prevent ourselves from going to the next step with God. We like to do what's comfortable. Uh, I know I, I, people say, you know, the pastor's supposed to be nice shepherd, you know, and kind of calm people and keep people, you know, uh, uh, you know, give them good advice and everything else. But sometimes the preacher's got to be the guy to give somebody a good, quick kick in the pants to get them going. Have someone who says, uh, you know, and I'm, and I'm not thinking of anybody here, and I don't think I've done this recently, you know, kind of thing. We, we do have a few, we need to do a few people, as they point out, in some of these places. But, you know, uh, I can't do that. Have you ever tried? You know, maybe try this smaller job and move up to it. Because some people, some people, some of you, even myself, some of us get too comfortable with the status quo. And somebody, some people, and I can think of, uh, I'm looking at here, is the person here this morning? Uh, yes, they are. I can remember when I encouraged this person to start in Awana, just listening to a couple of verses. And, I'll, and I tell you, I won't, I, the, that person is super involved in numerous ministries today. And I don't know if that would be there if they hadn't started out listening to verses in Awana. You see growth. And, and that's what happens. Sometimes it'll be, you know what? This Sunday school class of kids may be not your bag, <laughs> bag of tea, you know? But try it. And we need some help here. And maybe that's a place you can serve. Sometimes we get too comfortable. And we're going to find some other people here in the next verse that get too comfortable. Look at verse 7 and 8 with me. And the disciple, therefore, whom Jesus loved, and who's that? John. John said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, oftentimes we find out that um, John understands things first, but Peter acts first. So Peter acts first, but doesn't understand. And John's, we, we're reading in John, when we talk about the resurrection, they ran, to the, they ran to the tomb, and who got there first? John. He was, a, he was younger, a little faster. He got the, What did he do? He stopped. He stopped and he looked in. Peter comes up, puffing and puffing, the older guy, and what's he do? Blows right past John into the tomb. He looks, and it says, G Peter went off wondering. But it says, John believed. John seems to be perceptive. He's the guy that understands more quickly. Peter's the one that acts. And so John says to Peter, it's the Lord. <laughs> so what's Peter do? <laughs> Look, 
Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord. He put on his outer garments, for he was stripped for work, so he'd taken off his coat and much of stuff, and maybe down, stripped down to just his, uh, his undergarments or his, who knows, uh, his, uh, his T-shirt or whatever, and he threw himself into the sea. John says, the Lord, John, stand, John understands, Peter jumps out of the boat. Now, what is it about Peter? You can't keep him in the boat. You know? He's always going out of the boat. Uh, uh, some of us should be so lucky, huh? And, and who's, who's still staying in the boat? Everybody else. They're in the boat. Sometimes we can't stay in the boat. We've got to get out of our comfort zone. And Peter jumped out of the boat. Now, last time he jumped out of the boat, he sank. This time, only 100, 100 yards out, we think it's probably big enough that he was able to swim or maybe even touch bottom. I don't know how deep it was. It wasn't, it wasn't perhaps that much, but he was able to swim or, or walk through the water to get in. So, recognizing Jesus, he jumps out of the boat, and he, and he stripped for work. I, you know, I'm thinking, is he like Mary or Martha in this? You know, Martha wants to do the work, so hey, have all these guys that have this big catch of fish, right? And they're sitting there with all the fish. Peter says, forget the fish. I want to be with... Jesus. He jumps out of the boat and leaves the fish. He's ready to go see Jesus. Sometimes we do things that are uncomfortable. You know, I, I, uh, Easter was a challenge for me. Uh, our, our worship interns were able to go back to their home churches, and that was great. But then we needed somebody, so I had to jump into the job. Now, I've done that for, I did that for a whole year overseas, but it's been five years, you know. All the songs are new. I got to learn it. And thankfully, Adam was able to jump in there, and uh, I, we just found out, I just found out he could play guitar a few weeks ago. But, but before I knew he was coming in, I knew this was my job. I had to do it. Was I comfortable? You're probably all thinking, oh, the guy's got a music degree. He's sitting up here and no sweat off his back. I tell you, you won't, you won't believe how that week went, you know, uh, trying to play trumpet for the morning service. I hadn't played it since Christmas, you know, trying to get my lip back into shape, preparing the services, preparing the, the Thursday evening service with all the scriptures, then coming in here on Sunday and practicing with a, with a group of worship which were used to one thing. When I was overseas, I led it all the time. I have to worry. I was, I was the guy that would lead. And of course, it helped. I was a lieutenant colonel. And, you know, you don't tell a lieutenant colonel how to do things, you know, so they kind of succumb. Now, my primary, uh, my primary car for about six months was a full bird colonel. And he did fine, but we worked well together. But I mean, you're in your safe zone, you know how it's going. But to jump back into it and say, are these people going to follow me? How is it going to work and everything else? And, you know, you, I, I, I put in, you know, do this verse, go back to this verse. I mean, one of those songs had nine different numbers on it, so I remember <laughs> ready to go at it, you know? And it's, it's just, it's out of your comfort zone. But sometimes, like Peter, you got to jump out of your comfort zone and realize you got to do something for God. And Peter was there. He jumped out. Another, another example, and uh, it'll also be in the second service, but it's kind of, uh, you know, she says, here I am. All my friends are retiring. What am I doing? We're starting a daycare at the church, <laughs> you know? This is just dumb, you know? And, and she's frazzled a lot of the times because she's, she's spending full time doing it here, plus she's got her stuff at home going on. I mean, uh, her brother just got colon cancer, so she's running up to Vermont last week, went up to Vermont. Up in the morning, left at 7 o'clock in the morning, went up, went to his appointment, and came back and was home by evening. You know? I mean, this is always his life. But sometimes we got to get out of the boat. we got to do what God wants us to do. And so consequently, they recognized Jesus, and he got out of the boat. It was, sometimes I'm saying, you know, some people say, boy, my, my kid is just all over the place. Anybody have one of those kids where they're just all over the place, can't keep them down, you know? Just, and, I, and I think, you know what? I like that kind of a kid. You know why? I've seen some kids that, you know, just kind of sit there and you can't get them moving, can't encourage them, can't motivate them, whatever. I mean, it's, it's tougher to get a locomotive that's dead stopped moving than to steer a locomotive that's already headed down the track. And so sometimes for us to be moving is better. At least start moving in the direction that God wants you to go and let him guide you from there as you go down. Verse 9. It says, and well, we'll start in verse, and we'll just finish verse 8. But the other disciple came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 100 uh, yards away, dragging a net full of fish. Verse 9, the charcoal fire. And so when they got out of the, upon the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus had started cooking breakfast already, had a charcoal fire. Now, this might pass you by, but when was the last time that Peter saw a charcoal fire? Huh? In the, 
in the courtyard of the trial of Jesus. It specifically says they were around the charcoal fire warming themselves. And he looks over and his eyes make contact with Jesus. The last time he saw Jesus at a charcoal fire, he was denying him. So he sees the charcoal fire and he winds up uh, walking in and uh, verses 10 and 11 says that Peter then helps with the fish. And it's, it's kind of interesting. Jesus said to him, bring some of the fish which you have caught. Now where's Simon Peter? He's come in. The guys are struggling with the fish. He's talking to Jesus. Jesus says, bring some of the fish in. <laughs> Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. All Peter needed to hear was Jesus say, get me some fish. He was on it. God, Jesus, you tell me something to do. That's Jesus on the coat. I'm jumping out of the boat. I get to the shore, get me some fish. I'm back into the boat, you know, pulling in the fish. He wants to do it. He wants to follow what Jesus Christ is telling him to do. And then in verses 12 through 14, I call it breakfast with Jesus. Now, I hate eating breakfast alone. I've, I've tried that once. I went to the, you know, see these guys go to the uh, restaurant and they sit there with the newspaper in the morning and they just eat the, eat the breakfast and look at the, that's not me. I, I, I tried it once. I was at a conference, and I went to breakfast, and I thought, you know, these guys go and read the newspaper. I'm going to try that. So I bought myself a newspaper. I went to the, to the local, whatever it was, uh, IHOP or something. I sat down there and ordered breakfast, and breakfast comes, and I'm sitting there, you know, nobody around us may be able to read my paper. I'm thinking, this is stupid. I got so much work at home to do. I, here I have, a, I have a newspaper. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to fumble the newspaper, trying to eat with this hand, and I just, I just can't do this put the newspaper down, eat, and go home. And that's what I did. I don't like eat breakfast alone, and at this point, we had seven people eating breakfast with Jesus Christ. I don't know how you eat breakfast in the morning, but maybe there's a, a lesson in here. It's nice to start out the day at breakfast with Jesus, isn't it? I don't know how you start out your day. Um, I don't always make it. My, my, my devotions are in bed when, as I'm getting up. I wake up, the Bible's right here. I can pick it up and pull it out, you know? And uh, if I miss a day, next day I read two okay it may not be the best example but facts of life come up right but maybe it's early in the morning for you maybe it's at night maybe it's some other time but a daily breakfast with Jesus or meal with Jesus is really important if you don't have a uh, if you don't have a way to do this I might suggest go on your phone and one of the ones that I have is a, it's an app right here it's called our daily bread I click on our daily bread it brings up it brings up a two-minute thing to read and a verse of scripture. And in fact, when it brings up the verse of scripture, I don't know if it's going to come up here, it is. Uh, it is continue as a guest is the way I do it. And you, it brings up the day's thing. If you click on the, the scripture verse text it has, it goes right to the Bible text. And, and I can read the scripture in about one minute, two minutes. I click back, I can read the devotional. So there's no real reason a lot of times the day for not being able to at least start the day with a few moments with God. And I used that last year. It was, a, it was a great tool, but maybe that's for you. The principle is this. When th change, things change when we allow Jesus to show up. They were going back to the old thing, no fish. Jesus shows up, so many fish, they were afraid the net's going to break. Things change when Jesus shows up. In Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do through who strengthens me. Sometimes we wind up pedaling backwards because we're trying to do it without Jesus in our lives. We're not taking direction from him. There's some missing piece. Maybe it's, you know, we didn't go to church this week. I mean, I'm saying that God would do that. That God's going to zap you because you missed church on a week. But I'm saying maybe, maybe you're not making church a priority. Maybe your giving's not going to the right place. Maybe your devotions aren't, aren't, aren't consistent. Maybe you've got some action in your life that you know is wrong and you're just not willing to get rid of it. I don't know what it is. But sometimes it's because Jesus hasn't shown up. And when he shows up, things change. Verses 15 through 19, I call this Peter's chance at redemption. Peter's chance at redemption. Remember that he had already um, been... Uh, had, had already had a chance to meet Jesus. It says in Luke 24, 34, that... Uh, Jesus appeared to Peter. We don't know what that was all about. I've got this chart up if you want to fill this in. And you say, man, this is going a little over the top, but this is me. I'm a teacher, so I'll give it a little bit to you. You want to learn some Greek today, okay? How many people want to learn Greek? Excited about learning Greek today? Oh, yeah, okay, very good. All three of you. Uh, <laughs> um, there are three words in the Bible, the New Testament, that represent the word love, okay? One is, if you can see on the top, it's agapao. 
Agapao is the uh, verb form. Agape, which you often hear, is the, is the noun form. Agape or agapa, uh, agapao. The bottom left corner says phileo. And that's the, that's the, again, how you would spell it in Greek is right down underneath it. So you can, sp so you learn how to spell it in Greek or English. Now, I have these here because um, these verbs are important. Now, there's one other word that I don't even think is used in scripture at all. It was a Greek word. And it's um, eros. Eros. And it is a, what kind of love? An erotic love. It's sexual love. Okay? And so that word is not used in this context, and I don't think it's used at all, if I recall correctly, in the scriptures. But agapao, agape love, and phileo often used. Agape is like a, a close love, a spiritual love, a higher, the highest level of love you can have. Phileo, what's that sound like? Thank you. Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. Phileo is brotherly love. So we have God's kind of love, the highest form of love. We have brotherly love. I love you, or I like you as, so maybe I like you as a friend kind of thing. And then we've got erotic love, which is a sexual or a physical love. And so Jesus asked in this section, Peter, three questions after they finish breakfast or maybe at the end of breakfast. He says to him, um, Peter, do you love me? Akapao. And if you're filling in your notes, Peter responds, Jesus, you know I like you. And he says, tend to my lambs or feed my lambs. A second time, and I'll look right at the scriptures here so I can give you uh, the, the down and dirty of it in, in here. Uh, it says the second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, Jonas, do you love me? And he uses which word? Agape, agapao. Do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he said, why are you asking me the question? You know I love you. And he says, shepherd my sheep. But again, he's using the phileo word. You know that I like you. You're a great friend. The third time, we get down to it, and it says, he said to him, Simon, son of Jonah, son of Jonah, or son of John, do you love me? And this time, Jesus uses the word what? Phileo. Do you like me? Are you my friend? And Peter now answers to him the same way. You know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus says, tend my sheep. I don't know if Peter's thinking back to the denial, or what it is, but for some reason he can't bring himself to use the word agapao. And in this series, we think that the tend my lambs, shepherd my sheep, tend my sheep, each one is like a, a little higher resolution. I'm not going to go into all the details of that, but a little higher um, responsibility for him. He'd already met Jesus Christ personally, a personal uh, appearance of Jesus Christ. The thought may be that this is his public restoration. Now he has six disciples standing there. And he wants Peter to be able to be restored publicly because others saw him deny him so that the, guy, so that the guys, the disciples, would know Peter is back in the good graces of Jesus. How do you love Jesus? How do we show that we love Jesus? This whole section today is about Peter getting right with God. Uh, the song that you did uh, earlier, uh, Josh, about I'm forgiven just went so far in his so well with this. Peter needed to know he was forgiven, and so do we. There's an old preacher's advice that says, if you can do anything else and be happy, do it. It's not easy being a pastor. It's not easy being in God's work. It's not easier doing what he wants you to do. And he says, if you can do anything else and be happy, do it. The principle that I share with this one is God allows restoration even after great failures if we are willing. Don't use the excuses. Don't use the failures in your life to be an excuse for not going on with God. God forgives. If he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins. And lastly, verses 20 through 23. And actually, we, I've, I, there's a couple of verses I didn't mention here, and I'll just mention it. He says to Peter after this last one, he says, when you get old, People are going to take you where you don't want to go. 
You're going to want to go places. They're going to take him someplace else. And the scriptures tell us John speaking, and that's why we think maybe John wrote this chapter as an epilogue a little bit after the fact. He may have written this part after Peter's death. Maybe he finally understood what Jesus was talking about. But Jesus, he said when he talked to him about this not going where he wanted to go and others, people clothing him or girding him, he's speaking of the death that Peter would have. And Peter was indeed as far as history tells us, was crucified on the cross. And he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like Jesus Christ. And they crucified him upside down with his head downward. So Peter is told, you said you'll die for me? Peter, you're going to die for me. And then they take a little walk. And John follows them. I love a disciple, you know. They, he's following them, or sometimes they look over. And we come to verses 20 to 23. And Peter, turning around, saw the disciple who Jesus loved following them. The one who had been leading on his breast at supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? That's the same guy, the one that's writing this book. Peter, therefore, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if, you want him to re if I want him to remain until I come, what's that to you? You follow me. And then John adds, this saying, therefore, went out among the brethren that that disciple, John himself, would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? So perhaps he wrote this epilogue a little bit to also clear up that fact, because people were probably saying, John's never going to die. And he's saying, no, he said, what if this guy doesn't die, if I want him to live? But he said, that's not what's going to happen. So John was to clear this, up, um, this, this saying amongst the disciples that he's never going to die. But going back to this point with, with Peter, Peter turned around and looked at John. He was focusing on the wrong people. He started out focusing on the wrong things, the fish. Now he's focused on the wrong people, John. Have you ever, have, I don't know, maybe you've been in this spot. Obviously I have because I've heard these words, you know. But Johnny doesn't have to do that. And what's your mom say? You're not Johnny, right. Or if Johnny jumped off a bridge... Would you jump off a bridge after Johnny? No. We are focusing on the wrong people. Sometimes we look around and we say, oh, things aren't so, what about, what about that person? You know, um, you know that preacher's got a bigger church. That, that neighbor's got a bigger car and a bigger house. Or, you know, that coworker has uh, children who, who are, seem to be perfect. Or maybe it's, the, you know, the bank's hounding me too much because I don't know the bills. We put our focus on other things. That, that person's got a bigger retirement, and they, they get a chance to travel around the country, and I got stuck here with a, a job at age 70 or whatever it is. You know, I mean, we're always looking at other people. But Jesus says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, fixing your eyes on Jesus. We've got to fix our eyes on him. When we get distracted by other stuff, when we start looking around, that's when we walk wrong. Jesus had one message for Peter when he said, what about John? And what was that? You follow me. Don't worry about the other person. So what if they're a scoundrel and they don't believe in Jesus Christ and, they're, and, and God make them rich, you know, and they're, and they're filthy rich, and you don't have as much money? Don't worry about them. You look at yourself. Are you doing what's right before God? Are you following me? If you're following me, don't worry about the other person. Let me worry about them. You have one objective, and that is what? Follow me. Follow me. Jesus says, come unto me, all you are labor weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Go to him. He'll take care of things. Our principle for this, uh, for this particular point, don't become distracted, but fix your eyes on Jesus. Don't become distracted by the world, by your finances, by your job, by your family. Fix your eyes on Jesus first and follow me. Our final theme for this morning as we look at this is look to Jesus. Don't look back. Don't look back, look to Jesus. Don't look at what's taken place before. Don't look at how things were before. Don't look at what you've done before, whether it's good or bad, whether it's been tough or whether you've been successful. Don't look back. 
the scriptures say, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter whether you're 65, 85, or 35, or 25. Don't look back. Focus your eyes on Jesus. And this morning we're going to do that at his table. Focus your eyes on Jesus. He loved you. He sacrificed for you. He gave his life for you. And the question is, will you follow? Will you follow him and fix your eyes on him? Dear Lord, as we partake of this communion this morning, allow me to bless the bread and just more so bless us as we partake of this bread. May you help us to remember the suffering that you had for us. And may we look forward to what you will do for us in the future. May we fix our eyes on you and think of you this morning as we partake in Jesus' name.